What's up, everybody? Fantasy Philosophers back at you with another episode. We have a special guest today, uh, my good friend and fellow fantasy league mate, Alex, or FF Hustler 420 on Twitter. We'll make sure his handle is uh, underneath. Uh, but we're going to be talking about strength of schedule today um, as we get closer and closer to all these redraft leagues that are taking place. And we're actually going to focus on early season strength of schedule. We know many people tend to focus on the playoff schedule strength, but I think it's really important that you take a look at those first three to four games because, you know, being three and oh or two and one, it's much better than being oh and three or one and two, obviously. Um, But I think just getting off to that good start, your chances of making the playoffs increase significantly Uh, so that's going to be the focus uh, for today's video Um, I've done videos in the past with Alex but I don't think he's had the chance to introduce himself on on fantasy philosophers so Alex go ahead and uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself yeah so my name is Alex and everybody refers to me as the fantasy football hustler Um, on Twitter on Facebook on YouTube on Apple Podcasts. that's where you can find me fantasy football hustler and um, I just, I love fantasy all around. I like the IDP aspect of things and super flex side of things. So um, I like bringing a different perspective on a lot of different settings within the leagues. Right on. And uh, yeah, back up what he said, uh, IDP is where it's at. Fuck team defense. You know, he, he was kind of the one I, I kind of was inching that direction just after playing fantasy for so many years. But Alex, you were definitely the person that, that, that really showed me the light. And I, and I finally took that dive, drank the Kool-Aid, and I'm all in. Hashtag fuck team defense all day, every day. So nice. you're still doing team defense. Do yourself a favor. Convert it to an IDP league. It's so much more fun. You can thank us later. Give Alex props believe that so we're gonna go ahead and dive right in um and this is in no particular order we're just gonna bounce around from a few teams that their early uh schedule just stood out to us um but let's go ahead and start with the giants uh alex i'll let you kick us off what are your thoughts on early season schedule for the new york giants so i think it's gonna be pretty tough for them right out of the gates. And I mean, at least with a couple of them, I mean, the Steelers, that's going to be a really tough game on Monday night, you know, for their very first game. And then um, backing it up with the bears. I think that the bears defense is going to be a little bit nicer than it's been the last couple of years. I mean, it's already middle top of the pack, you know, but I think with guys like Robert Quinn coming over, that's going to make their defense go to the next level. And if Roquan Smith can kind of, uh, you know, take his game to the next level, that defense is just going to be a lot nicer than it's been. Um, Then they got the 49ers and the Rams. I mean, 49ers, we know that, I don't know, every aspect of their defense is just on point. I mean, if anything, you might be able to beat them on the ground, you know, so maybe that's where Saquon kind of mixes in. But um, I don't like their schedule to start. I'm not fading Saquon necessarily, but you know, with some of their wide receivers, maybe that's like, you know, just one of the things that if I'm leaning on one of the guys versus someone else and the other guy that I'm leaning on has a nicer schedule to start, I may just pick the other guy over, over Slayton, you know? Yeah, right on. Um, I'm on board with everything that you mentioned. I mean, against the Steelers, the Bears, you know, Maybe not the dominant defense that they once were, but it is in play, being played in Chicago, which I think changes things a bit. Um, you know, so still, you know, maybe without the fans this, this year, I hadn't even thought of that. Maybe that changes things some to be determined. But anytime you play the Bears in Chicago, I'm usually expecting a tough matchup. 49ers, Rams, like you said. Um, 
it'll be real interesting to see how the 49ers do now that they no longer have DeForest Buckner. You know, um, I believe they have Quan Alexander back as well, who, from what I've been reading, is they intend for him to start. So seeing what he's capable of after just being riddled with injuries the last couple of seasons. But, yeah, this is a murderer's row of a, a first few games to start off your league. So, you know, early in the summer I heard a lot of people – seriously saying that they would take Saquon over CMC this year in drafts. And if you're still one of those people that's considering that, do yourself a favor, abort that plan immediately. Um, As good as Saquon is, when you got an opening schedule such as they do, man, it's – it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. And again, not that I'm fading Saquon. I'm just not picking him over CMC for sure. And I would even consider people such as Elliot, even Kamara potentially. Um, so that's that. But yeah, real nervous about the Giants, you know, um, and not just to stay completely focused on Saquon. Daniel Jones as well. Um, I'm a huge Daniel Jones fan. I think long-term he will do really well in the league. This is not the season to draft him, though. You know, if you got him in a dynasty league, that's awesome. You probably won't be playing him that much this year. But, um, yeah, unless he just falls significantly, I I would avoid Daniel Jones, you know, to start – not only start the year, but looking even further. Damn, what a tough schedule overall. But anywho, um, yeah, giant skill players, man. Not saying fade them completely, but take a look at the schedule. See what you're getting yourself into. Because if there's someone else on another team that you're, you know, pretty close on, you know, use that as a tiebreaker most definitely. But That's the New York Giants. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shift right on over to the Chicago Bears. So what's really interesting about the Chicago Bears is they actually have a very great early season schedule. They play the Lions, the Giants, the Falcons, and then the Colts. But those first three, I I. I would feel really confident, um, you know, that the offense should do well. But on the flip side, we don't know who the quarterback is. The reports about David Montgomery suffering a groin strain, that's very concerning. So although the situation appears to be very favorable, is there really anyone – to draft outside of Allen Robinson potentially to take advantage of that? What are your thoughts, Alex? Well, I think it really depends on value and your league size. You know, if you're in a one QB league, I mean, you're never drafting Foles or Trubisky anyways. You know, if you're in a super flex, I mean, that's a different story. So it really just depends on what kind of league you're in. I mean, I mean, I feel like um, Anthony Miller, you know, to start, that might be someone to take a shot on initially, just um, while Montgomery's hurt, maybe just right out of the gates. I know they have uh, – their schedule's nice, you know. So, I mean, I guess rather a guy like that who's maybe like their second wide receiver. We still don't know where Cordell Patterson's going to mix in. We know he's going to play, but, shit, he might take more reps at running back than he does at wide receiver and just uh, while he, Montgomery. He has been currently with the, the Montgomery injury, so – We'll see. We'll see. Um, so, Anthony Miller, yeah, I, for whatever reason, he didn't come to mind. So, I'm glad you brought him up. Um, what, are thoughts, what are your thoughts about the Jimmy Graham situation? Like, is there anything left in the tank? Because they paid the man. So, I'm just wondering, like, is he rejuvenated and going to just have this resurgence? Or are they just stupid? I, Jimmy Graham, I mean, he's probably – like my second or third favorite, like tight end all time, just his skill set and how good he is. And it's a shame like him and yeah, it. Yeah, of course. I agree with that. They, you know, turned into guys who just get hurt all the time. I mean, 
I, I'm not banking on them. I mean, if you play in like a double tight end league or, you know, something like that, maybe it's a tight end premium or, you know, then maybe, but I don't know. I, I'm just not messing with the Bears tight ends. I mean, if your team has 10 tight ends on it, I, I just – all of them are just levels of trash. Yeah, I agree. And and just to echo what you mentioned, uh, I love Jimmy Graham as a player as well. It was – I really enjoyed watching him play, you know, during his prime. But after two seasons of just underwhelming to be nice about it, I was shocked to see that he gets paid $9 million this year. But good for him. Good for him. Um, any final thoughts on the Bears and their early season schedule at all? Not really, other than um... – the thing that I'm really curious about is where's Montgomery really go now? Like what's his real value going to be? Cause he's still going to get drafted, you know, in redraft leagues. It's just now, where do you take him knowing that he may only play 15 games, you know, at the most, maybe 13 games at the least, maybe he makes it back for week one, but I don't know if he makes it back. It makes me a little weary because um, they might be rushing him back. That's a great point. Um, yeah, it's it's really tough because I wasn't that concerned about the injury because just in my mind, I'm thinking if it's something that the organization is truly concerned about, then they would at least be hearing about them bringing in guys to take – I haven't heard of anything. Yeah. So – but then on the flip side, man, a groin injury for a running back, I mean, even if they claim he's healthy and ready to go, if I own him, I'm going to be terrified to start him until I see a couple games. So that's really going to be tough. Um, had the injury not popped up, you know, he'd be looking nice. Um would you take him anywhere in a draft? Like, what, what what round would he have to fall to for you to say, all right, let me snatch him so, up? So I'm glad you asked this because I just recently, prior to the injury, we did it the weekend before I think he got injured on a Monday, um, and I snagged him – I believe I snagged him in the six, and I thought it was like a, a steal of the draft in the moment. I was like, yeah – and then Monday comes around and that ha – so I think a lot about what you what you mentioned earlier, like where is he going or what type of a value in the draft. It depends on when your draft is, you know, because I thought I just had the steal of the draft, grabbed him in the six. Ooh, I'm on my high horse riding high. And then a couple of days later, he's out two to four weeks. So, at, you know, I'd say if you're drafting today – Oh, man, I'd probably wait until at least the eighth just to be cautious because, you know, I, there's many more running backs that aren't injured. And that's just a position that you don't want to draft someone knowing they're already injured because people are going to get injured regardless. So it's just kind of like you're setting yourself up for failure in a sense in my opinion anyway. I mean, I do like Montgomery, but it just poor timing. There's just not enough details. Um, I actually, off, off topic, but I think Fournette may end up going to the Bears, but we'll see. Um, that's for another episode. But, um, yeah, it's tough, man. It all comes down to when your draft is. I mean, ideally, um, I know the – the redraft league that I'm a commissioner of our draft is legit the, the Wednesday night before that first Thursday game. So hopefully there's a lot more details out about the injury by that time. And then, you know, it'll be much easier to assess where he should go. Sure. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe his ADP all summer was like fifth round, give or take. Yeah. So I guess uh, if you're feeling bold, Go for it. I, you know, it's just 
in this crazy season that we're about to experience, I just don't feel good about drafting someone that I know is dealing with injury currently. That's for sure. Yeah. But that's that. Um, in fact, I ended up trading him because of that injury. Um, but we won't get into the dra- trade details. So uh, let's see. Who do we have up next on our list, Alex? I uh, got the Cardinals. Okay, let's go ahead and kick us off. W- what are your thoughts about the Cardinals? So let me see here. Where are they? Uh, hold on, I had them here. So they got the 49ers to start the season, but outside of that, it, it's looking pretty nice. Washington, then the Lions, then the Panthers. So 49ers always going to be a rough matchup, you know, any mm-hmm. inter any inner division game with the, you know, NFC West, that's always going to be tough. But um Outside of that, I, I mean, I love their schedule. I mean, Washington, their defense is nice, but um, their offense isn't that nice, so they're, they're probably going to be on the field a lot. I mean, Kyler Murray is someone that I like. Makes me a little nervous because you got to kind of draft him, like, at his ceiling. Drake, I wish we knew more info about him because I really like that schedule to start the season off. I mean, that that's outside of the 49ers. I mean, that's a really nice – it's like – three out of four games. Um, you, you like that for the wide receivers too? I mean, I don't know. Even the I, – I, I like it for every position outside of the 49ers. Like, I keep looking at the schedule, and I just keep seeing that first game, and it's like – Yeah, I mean, the first one is concerning, but you know what I could just – When you said the 49ers, what I keep seeing over and over in my head is Sammy Watkins torching Richard Sherman in the Super Bowl. So I'm just kind of like, well, maybe, maybe maybe not so bad. And, you know, 49ers, DeForest Buckner's no longer there, like we mentioned. Um, Who knows? Who knows? And, And I agree. It's I love Kyler as well. And he's another player that I traded away. And. I loved him. It was so hard to trade him, but I just felt like people were willing to give you what they expect him to do versus what he's actually done. So taking advantage of that is probably smart. Um, Washington, they'll certainly, they're certainly going to test the offensive line of Arizona. That's for sure. But just overall, I, I wouldn't be scared of the matchup by any means. Lions, Panthers, and then just going one game further than you mentioned, the Jets, you know, after trading away one of the best safeties in the game, that that should be a chalk game there. So, yeah, things are looking nice. Uh, You mentioned Kenyon Drake, and, yeah, I'm nervous too, man. I, I'm set up for win-now mode in a dynasty league, and he's one of my running backs along with Derrick Henry. So I, 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 hearing the whole walk boot thing just uh, destroyed me. So only time anything will tell. Like, What's that? And anything like that in the preseason sucks. I mean, especially now that we don't – well, if this was a real regular season, he wouldn't be playing in the preseason anyways, you know, with that. So, I mean, either way, but. And it's just so weird with some of the stuff that's been coming out. Like, I think someone quoting him as saying he was wearing it as a, a precaution. It's like, yeah. bro, are you that injury prone? Like, well, <laughs> I guess he does have a history. So, who knows? I just, I don't know what to think about it. It's kind of like carry on Johnson wearing this knee brace, even though he's not injured. I don't fucking know. Well, but, I yeah, can't. the Cardinals are going to be a fun team to watch, man. Um, with D hop there. I'm thinking this is Larry Fitzgerald's final year. Um, Christian Kirk, even Andy Isabella. I, I'm not counting him out. I know a lot of people have, I'm still on him. Um, if if they use him correctly, I think that offense, assuming the offensive line can protect just average, not even, you know, extremely well, just pass protection is average. I think this offense is going to be extremely difficult to stop. So very exciting up and coming team for sure. Yeah. Sure. But uh, 
all comes down to the Kyler D hop connection, how quick that happens. And then this precautionary walking boot of Kenyon Drake. So we'll see, we'll see, but yeah, the, the schedule certainly, certainly looks very nice, very, very nice. So, you know, if you see, a, if you got a Cardinal player and a player from another team, don't forget this opening schedule is quite favorable. You want to get out to that good start. So may lean with that Cardinal player. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the Houston Texans and get out of the way. Uh, I'm going to get destroyed by my friends. I already know lots of, lots, lots of my friends are, are Texans fans and, and I root for the Texans as well. Um, Houston Oilers, though, for life, as you can see. The Houston Texans, man, I feel so bad for DeAndre uh, Deshaun Watson. Sorry. He loses D Hop. He's got some wide receivers with speed. The only one that's proven anything is Brandon Cooks. Will Fuller, you know, if somehow, some way he stays healthy for 16 games, he could be a fantasy star. He'd also have to stop dropping all these open touchdown passes. But, um, they man, Chiefs, the, like the Ravens, the Steelers, then the Vikings, those first four, those are going to be tough. And when you got a new running back, you lost your best skill, uh, skill player outside of the quarterback position and DeAndre Hopkins. You're bringing in Brandon Cooks, who hasn't played with Deshaun. Man, I just. And then seeing the Chiefs come back from that huge deficit last year, I mean, they're probably dreading that game, I'd imagine, because that's just embarrassing. The Ravens are stout, Steelers. We'll see about the Vikings, D, but I just think, generally speaking, they'll be good. Whew. It's either going to be a long and miserable season for the Texans or Deshaun Watson is in the running for league MVP. One of the two. That's my opinion. But, man, ouch. That is a tough season to start with. What are your thoughts? I mean, Watson's probably going to have to throw it 600 times. I mean, if they're smart and they use David Johnson and Duke Johnson the way that they, you know, to their skill set, a lot of them are going to be nice dump-offs, you know, to those guys as well. I mean – it could kind of go both ways because their schedule is really hard as far as like the Texans winning football games. But if they're just playing catch up and they're just having to throw the ball all the time, I mean, that could lead to a lot of stats as well. Good point. That's a good point that I hadn't even gotten to. So I'm glad you brought that up, you know, trash time, those points count just as much. So agreed there, agreed there. And we uh, are that the chiefs is going to, to be a high scoring game with them the Ravens is going to be a high scoring game I mean Texans Ravens their defense, defense though bro I, I I'm terrified of that Ravens defense to be honest them and the Chargers looks nice as well but it sucks about the Derwin news but the Ravens defense just seems to be set for just a just mind-boggling dominant season could be wrong, but we'll find out. I mean, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I've seen Watson do it more than a few times. I mean, I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm leaning on more than yeah. it. The you only reason line. to be optimistic at all, in my opinion, is you have Deshaun Watson at quarterback. And you do have uh, Tunzel. You got Tunzel. The, the line, the line should be okay. I just. It's a tough you know, you don't really have that alpha possession wide receiver to go to, you know? I mean, you got these guys where they're burners. So, if, yeah, if they burn someone and they're wide open, they, they should catch the ball. But they don't really have anyone to go up. Because with D-Hop, there could be two people on them. And then if worst-case scenario, given the situation is appropriate – 
Watson throws it up to D hop and it seems like seven, eight times out of 10, he comes down with the reception. That, that's just, that luxury is gone. Um, I almost think that Deshaun Watson may have a, a season rushing wise, similar to Lamar last year. He might. I mean, I think a lot of it's going to come down to health with the Texans. Cause I mean, like we talked about Will Fuller, I, that's going to make a difference. I mean, they keep talking about how he's got like a new strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I mean, Will Fuller could be like a top five wide receiver if he could stay healthy. Like that's what talent level he's at. He just can't stay healthy for more than a couple of games. Yep. True that. It. Well, hoping, hoping for the best for the Houston Texans. I just, I'm preparing myself for the worst. <sighs> We'll see, man. I tell you what, if if somehow, some way the Texans are able to actually re-sign Deshaun Watson, man, they better count their lucky stars. Cause if I was him, I would want to get out of there ASAP. But we'll see, man. We'll see. Um, who we got next? Bengals. Bengals. Go ahead. Dive in. Let, let's hear your thoughts on the Bengals. So, Bengals, I think. I mean, you mentioned the Chargers. That's their first matchup. I don't know. Chargers always find a way to, like, play up to the competition or, like, play down to their competition. So, I think that's going to be – I mean, I, I think that's going to be an easier game for them at least to uh, get the ball moving. Maybe not winning-wise. You know, I'm just talking about fantasy-wise. And then they got the Browns, which everybody on the Browns' defense is hurt right now. Eagles and then Jaguars. So, Chargers are their toughest matchup, and that's game one. And um, I don't know who would expect Joe Burrow to come out and just go crazy game one. Um, so, maybe it's more of a, a Joe Mixon game coming out of the blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not a bad schedule by any means. You know, I – I just always have to temper my expectations for rookie quarterbacks, especially early on. Um, you mentioned Joe Mixon. I'm starting to wonder more and more if there is a holdout approaching, you know, with him sitting out practice with these migraines that, you know, I haven't been following it extremely closely so if you know more about it please let me know but it seemed like this migraine thing just came out of nowhere and then obviously for those of you who watch hard knocks you know based under the new uh cba deal it, from what i'm seeing is if you don't show up to practice you're fined significantly but apparently showing up in street clothes and just not doing a single thing is acceptable so I'm just real curious if there truly is a medical reason for him to continue sitting out or if this goes back to wanting that contract extension. Any thoughts on that? I mean, it could have to do with the contract. I mean, the all signs point to that. I mean, I don't know. Migraines is a tough thing to say whether he's lying or not. Cause I mean, maybe yeah, he did. of course. And you know, um, when they put their pads on, I, I, cause I think he did go to the, the padded practice. I, I mean, I, I think he's only missed a couple days. So that, I guess I'm not sure on, but I feel like he got a couple days worth of the padded practice. It's probably about the contract. I mean, at this point I would rather have guys fresh rather than anything. Everyone just seems like they're going to be on the same boat as far as like, nobody's going to have any real reps, like scrimmage reps aren't the same as preseason reps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Um, and I think a lot of it as well, you know, as far as Joe Burrow having a successful rookie campaign is what's left with AJ Green, you know, like, I, I have no idea what to expect. I mean, I could see him finishing as a top 10 wide receiver on the year. If he's 100% healthy plays every game, I could also see him in redraft leagues getting dropped after a handful of games just for not producing. I, I have no idea what to expect from him. Um, I am really high on Tyler Boyd, though. I think Tyler Boyd 
especially where he's going. I think ADP is like seventh round ish. You know, seeing what Justin Jefferson did with Burrow out of the slide in LSU, you know, it just seems like Burrow is just a slot kind of guy. And and the past two seasons, Boyd's done well with who at quarterback, you know? So definitely like Boyd. I'm hoping Mixon – I'm hoping it's not a holdout, you know, maybe the migraines, maybe it's from all the partying that he's been doing on Instagram live, who knows, um, who knows, we'll, we'll find out, but yeah, I think the Bengals long-term though, their future looks bright, we'll see how improved that offensive line actually is, um, I'm also real excited to see if uh, old John Ross can actually stay healthy and do something because we saw it last season there were those few games where he was looking like what everyone thought he would be when coming into the league but just injuries man the guy can stay healthy who 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 can cover him deep nobody so r- real interesting season coming up for the Bengals real real interesting and any any final thoughts about Cincinnati just seems like a lot of it's based around health. I mean, um, Tyler Boyd, and he's been pretty much the the backbone of their receiver core. Seems like for the last two years, because Green's been hurt. I mean, we know that Green has the potential. I'm avoiding him at all costs, just because you know, even though he is going seventh, eighth round. I mean, there's still other guys around him that just aren't as risky injury wise for me. So, I'm avoiding him. Um, Especially he already got hurt in the preseason. Exactly. And with his age, and it's not just the age. I think it's the age combined with, you know, his size and his structure, those big receivers. I mean, Julio Jones is just excluded. He's kind of like the Adrian Peterson of the wide receivers. He's just – he was grown in a Petri dish somewhere, so – he doesn't count, but anyone else, you know, you think like Des Bryant, Brandon Marshall, those kind of people, it's, it's about that time where things usually, usually come to a pretty quick drop. I mean, I would love to see AJ Green ball out and prove everyone wrong. I just think the odds are stacked against him, and with so much time that he's missed, I mean, you I think I just rust alone. It, I would think it would impact his season just because when's the last time he's played a game like a season and a half ago? Well, yeah. Um, two seasons ago, I think he played a game, but um, yeah, that's, yeah two, that's a while. That was his last full season and he balled out that year. I mean, I think, I don't know if he was a top 10, but I know he's top 15 wide receiver fantasy wise. He was he's just so talented, man. I mean, I don't I don't know if anybody I think Randy Moss, they said, is the only person to have their six opening seasons go for a thousand yards. So I mean, that's just something that I mean, his ta- his talent's proven. Oh, it's yeah. just his body's breaking down. Yep, father time, man. That sorry son of a bitch him. Oh, but, a- anywho. We're going to go ahead and shift over and talk a little bit about the old Carolina Panthers. So with so much that's changed with the Carolina Panthers, you know, there's still some things that probably we need to see play out once the season starts, but just taking a look at the schedule, they play the Raiders, Buccaneers, Chargers, Cardinals, Falcons, Panthers. So Chargers, probably a pretty good D. Buccaneers should also be another good one. But Raiders, Cardinals, Falcons, pretty favorable. Um, man, I'm just so curious about Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, that that that's the key. But, I mean – you know, going back to what I mentioned about Saquon, um, anyone that heard what he has to go up against and 
you just heard what CMC is going up against. It's a no-brainer. Go CMC. You don't be dumb. Um, yeah, a, a pretty pretty good early season schedule, honestly. But for me, outside of CMC and uh, DJ Moore, I don't really know who, if anyone else on the team, I would feel confident starting that early in the season at least. What are your thoughts on that? It, yeah, it a lot goes down to your rosters because if you're not playing in a super flex or a two QB league, I, I don't see the reason of drafting Bridgewater. But in a super flex league, he's going to be going in all yeah. leagues. Yeah. So. Good point. Good point. Just, just so many changes. You know, the coaching staff, you know, it seems like the – past couple of seasons there's been so much off-season hype surrounding Curtis Samuel and he just hasn't done it yet they bring in Robbie Anderson um you know who has that experience with the new coach in town back uh in his college days playing at Temple um and even Ian Thomas who intrigues me but you know at the end of the day the can Teddy Bridgewater feed so many mouths? I feel like there's going to be probably two of those five. Let's see. So CMC and DJ Moore for sure. But then out of Curtis Samuel, Robbie Anderson, and Ian Thomas, who do you think is the top dog out of those three? Ian Thomas. I feel like um... – I mean, he was learning under Olsen, so, I mean, that's a big thing. They they let Olsen go. I mean, I, I know that that wasn't an easy move for them just because of his ties to the team and how long he's been there. So, I feel like they let him go, mainly because Thomas is going to be the guy this year. I feel like Anderson is going to eat into Curtis Samuel's, you know, game a little bit because it seemed like – out of Samuel and DJ Moore, I mean, I guess both of them are kind of like deep threats, but it just seemed like Curtis Samuel just seemed to be the deep guy more than DJ Moore. He more just seemed like more of the possession guy. So I feel like I'm not touching Curtis Samuel or Robbie Anderson. I mean, unless I'm in a really, really deep league. Ian Thomas, I don't really have a reason to draft him, but he's going to be on my radar as a tight end who – if he does good in the first game or two, I'm probably going to swoop up just to make sure that nobody else gets him. He's got a lot of potential. And we know that Teddy Bridgewater likes to target the tight end as well. Yeah, great point. I think Ian Thomas is certainly a, a guy that if you take that strategy of fading the tight end position and then grabbing at least, you know, two tight ends extremely late in the draft, that would be one to potentially target most definitely um but lot, lots of optimism for me um for the panthers at least offensively so uh we'll see if teddy two gloves can uh can put some, something together and, and make a little run here but real exciting times for that carolina panthers offense for sure and their defense is going to be garbage so i mean that's yeah a like their defense is going to be horrible. They're going to be in a lot of high scoring games. I mean, for IDP, I mean, Shaq Thompson, I mean, not someone who's going really high just because he's going to be Expected. on the field a lot. Yeah. Guys, Yeah, I agree, man. Like, because I remember one of the first IDP drafts I did, it was projecting him so many points. And I was looking at his past production and I was just like, is this a glitch? Like, what are they talking about? And then I kind of, Saw the whole picture, like, Luke Keekley's going, okay, that makes sense. I got you. He's going to be on the field all the time. Okay, I got you. And he but, did with Keekley there also. So now that he's just going to be the man there and he's going to be the, you know, the alpha on that defense, I feel like he's going to be in for a really big season. Yeah, well, wonder how long it'll take them to – uh to get a, a good enough D to actually contend because they certainly got some great pieces on, on the offensive side. So they drafted that rookie, the safety um, chin, and uh, um, he's probably going to be a starter right away. So I'm curious to see if he's going to live up to the hype. Yeah. I forgot that Panthers. Hmm. 
Yeah, I forgot about that. But yeah, I know who Chin is. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But Teddy Two Gloves, man, I think he's the key. He really is the key. And the thing with him is I see so many clips of him throwing just beautiful, accurate, deep passes during practice. When do we get to see that in the game? Somebody tell me, because I'm waiting. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. Because if he can actually do that when there's no when there is pressure, he should have been unleashed a long time ago. So we'll we'll, we'll find out soon enough. Soon enough, kickups right around the corner. We talked. Um, yeah, we got one more team left. So Alex, I'm gonna let you. Uh, Go ahead and kick us off with this final team that we'll be discussing today. All right. So the Raiders, that's who we got left on the on the schedule here. And um, let, let me just run down a handful of games here. So we got Raiders versus the Panthers. We already talked about how bad the Panthers are going to be. Um, the game is in Carolina. Um, then they play the Saints, which Saints have nice defense, but just because the Saints' offense is so high-scoring, might be a high-scoring game there. Uh, Patriots, that's probably going to be one of their tougher games out of the out of the blocks because they're playing in Foxborough. Then they got the Bills, and then they got the Chiefs, and then they got the Bucks. Ooh, so, man. Chiefs not, are gonna, not the easiest start to say the least. Um, yeah, I mean. So Josh Jacobs. What are your thoughts with this offense? Yeah, start with Josh Jacobs. I want to hear. I want to hear your input on him. I mean, he's really the only guy. I mean, he's really the only guy that I want out of their offense. I mean, you know, Waller. He's someone who. Well, I'll get into him and I'll tell you my thoughts on him in a second. But I know that Gruden loves Jacobs, and he's like pissed that Jacobs didn't win Rookie of the yeah. Year, and. What did he go for? Like 1,150 yards on only uh, – he missed three games, so he only played 15 games. And they keep talking about how they want to get him more involved in the passing game. And, um, you know, I'm not worried about Riddick or, you know, Richard. I mean, it, I feel like they're probably not going to increase his touches, but if they turn his touches into, you know, a handful of receptions also, that's just going to make his value just through the roof. Yeah, I agree with that. I actually remember the offseason going into his rookie year that summer. He worked out with Julio Jones the entire summer, specifically on his receiving skills. So I, my mind was blown when he didn't get more opportunity to work in the past game his rookie season. So hopefully it's coming. Hopefully it's coming. Um, any any of these receivers that you think are worth drafting based on where they're going or complete fade for you? I, I'm fading all around. I mean, um, it, it's tough. The, the rookies, Edwards and Ruggs, I mean, they draft Ruggs in the first round, but then all you hear out of camp is that Edwards and Carr have this, like, connection. And um, so, I don't know. It's going to be one of those things. I, I'm just avoiding – I mean, maybe as like a last round pick, you know, going with someone like Edwards or Ruggs if they're still there. Um, Waller, I feel like, is the only other piece that's highly coveted there. I think – so I had Waller in a handful of leagues last year, and he finished off as like the tight end five or six. So like season long, he did great. But game to game, he was kind of shaky. I mean, really anybody outside of Kelsey and Kittle – I mean, they're not game to game locked and loaded like guys, you know, um, maybe Ertz this year, maybe Andrews, but I even had Andrews in a couple leagues last year and he wasn't locked and loaded for me every single game. So I feel like if I don't get Kittle, Kittle Kelsey or Ertz, I'm just fading tight end and I'm like passing up a guy like Waller who seems to be going a little too high for my liking. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so Josh Jacobs, I, I've already touched on him a little bit. I'm a huge fan, huge fan. Um, Gruden, throw the man the ball. There's no reason not to. End of story. Um, Waller, I don't know what to think about Waller. I didn't have any shares of him last season. I mean, obviously, I, I saw where he finished at the end of the year. I'm wondering if 
they drafted the receivers they did to open up more of the underneath routes for Waller and use him as the focal point of that passing offense? Or did they just use Waller out of just pure necessity last season and he's not really – I'm not going to say he's not in the plans because they gave the man a bag, but he's not going to be the primary um, option in the past. I don't know what to think at all. I have no clue. Um, and he's an older tight end. You know, he broke out at such a late age. <sighs> the thing with the Raiders, I guess it's all about their philosophy, you know, and it just seems like, they want to run the ball and they want to have fast receivers, you know, and go deep. And I mean, you know, drafting rugs, I mean, that's stereotypical, like Raiders first round. Pick. Yeah, Al Davis must have been there that day because I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, Al Davis would have done it and everyone been like, of course, like, we all knew he was going to pick rugs, but, you know, now I don't, I just don't know why they did that. I, you can find speed in later rounds. They could have got Lamb, Judy. To draft rugs that high, they better have a lot of schemed up plays to take advantage of his speed speed and other skills. Because if he's just going to be used as a burner just to try to open up underneath stuff, I mean, what a waste of a first-round pick. And it's not like Carr is going to be a guy who's airing it out like that. I mean, maybe. Exactly. He's he's one of the short, you know, he's accurate, but he keeps it. He has that quick release. He gets it out in a hurry. So, yeah, you're, you're so right. I mean, but then on the flip side, we might see Ruggs take a handful of slants to the house. So, this is just one that's just a, a complete mystery to me in, in all honesty. I wouldn't blame anyone for drafting any of the skill players. Um, I think Ruggs is going just a little too high for me to ever consider him. Um, but Josh Jacobs, I, I would feel very confident, even though facing such a tough schedule, I would still feel confident based on what he showed last season. Um, I just – you know, when you when you dive in and look at what he actually did as a rookie, I mean, it's just it's he got no first. pass work. He got no pass work. Yeah, last. yeah. And, but I mean, like some of the metrics that he achieved just aren't even being talked about. Like, if I'm not like, I believe he was the most elusive running back in the entire league. He may have also had the most yards after contact in the entire league, if not the most among the leaders. I mean, he did some pretty incredible things, and it seems like since he missed those last few games, just no one remembers. Just... Well, and his lack of pass work, I think, only makes me value him more because he balled out that much with no pass work at all. Yeah. Like, what, 20 receptions on the season or something like that? something really small yeah hardly any but yeah I'm a huge huge Josh Jacobs fan um I'm I'm very high on him as well as Miles Sanders this season like I keep finding myself in this dilemma where I have to pick between the two and I fucking hate it but I was just gonna ask you who would you pick out of those two because they're going in a lot of drafts almost back to back I would, I would have to go Miles just because I know for a fact he will absolutely be involved in the passing game. That's, that's the only reason. If, if, if I knew that they were both going to be involved fairly equally, it would be a much tougher decision. I'd have to really look at the, the Eagle schedule. Um, but they're right there, man. You can't go wrong either way. Um, I actually took – Miles Sanders in a dynasty startup, seventh overall, um, I'd say two or three weeks ago, and I got a lot of hate in the in the draft chat about it. And I was like, hey, man, I, I wanted my guy. I wanted my guy. 
you know, I did, I did try to trade down with a few people, but they were giving me crap offers where it just wasn't worth it. So I just took my guy, um, you, you know, so I could be wrong, but I'd rather be wrong on something that, you know, I thought it, I went with it. If it's wrong, it is what it is, but staying true to myself. There you go. So I'm so, on the side of that. I'd rather have Jacobs. And I think um, outside of Cook, so I, I have Jacobs after Cook. So, well, actually, no, after uh, um, CEH now. So I have Jacobs right around like, you know, seven, eight before Henry, before Sanders, a few other guys. I don't know. I just feel like the Raiders want to pound the ball. And he really showed his skills last year. He showed that he's an elusive back, like you said. Like, a lot of those advanced metrics aren't really being talked about. And I don't think the Raiders completely flipped the script and turned into, like, a team that throws it, you know, 600 times this year. I think that they feed the beast. They drafted him, what, 15th overall two years ago? So, I mean, they're invested in him. Yeah. The only other thing that concerns me and makes me lean Miles Sanders is last season, anytime the Raiders got, you know, they're playing from behind, Jacobs was practically just off the field, yeah. which is ignorant in my opinion, but that's the way they went about it. Now, based on a lot of the reports coming from that coaching staff, I, I'm optimistic that that won't be the case. It seemed like they were just – giving him quote unquote rookie treatment. But that's another thing that would make me lean Sanders because you know, Sanders won't be coming off the field in those situations. If they continue to do that with Jacobs and that's going to, that's going to be a massive hit to that potential production he could have had. And one thing I think we got to remember, Jacobs was playing hurt. All of last year, his shoulder Man, was a warrior and still put on. What, what a running back, man. Gruden. That could be a reason. I, I don't know if that's why he didn't get up. You know, if your shoulder's really messed up. I was thinking about that as well. Like, did that affect? But then I'm wondering, when did the shoulder injury happen? Because it couldn't have happened at the beginning of the season because they just weren't using him at all. But it could have very well played into it as the season progressed. I agree. That's something I considered. It's just, you know, deciding between those two, they're so close. They're just those, those couple of things that would make me go miles um, but I could be on the opposite end of that after this upcoming season. We'll see, man. But both bright futures. We're going to have a great time watching both Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs play in the NFL for many, many years. So super stoked. Yep. Well, hey, Alex, I appreciate it as always, man. We'll certainly have you back soon. Um, you want to give a shout out or – Anything at all before we before we end it? Yeah, just make sure you follow me on Facebook and Twitter. It's at FF Hustler 420. Um, the uh, community that we got on Facebook's really growing, so it's called Fantasy Football Advice Experts, Gurus, and Beginners. Uh, we just crossed 8,000 members, and really a good place to get some advice, start and sit advice every week. Um, that's the first place where if there's an injury that comes. I'm always posting it there first for that community before I throw it on Twitter and other things like that. But um, yeah, that's a good place. So just go into Facebook and search fantasy football advice, and then you'll see our group. It's the fantasy football advice experts, gurus, and beginners. Yeah. And uh, I know you sent me that link at some point. If you want to shoot it to me again, I can be sure to get that in the description for everyone. Cause, uh, Lots of great content that Alex is pumping out. So those of y'all that want to stay woke and be in, be in the end, go ahead and make sure to join that, that Facebook group. Uh, other, other than that, that'll conclude this episode. Alex, it's been a pleasure as always. Fantasy Philosophers signing out. Until next time. Peace, everyone. Peace.